Okay, let's start. I can't wait to introduce you guys to um, Marcel Pepita. I probably said that wrong. He told me. Pep you what butchered it? it, Colleen. Yeah, it's uh, Pepita. We practiced uh, this too before the I session. No, I know. Okay, <laughs> let me try again. Um, Marcel <laughs> Pepita. Uh, he's the uh, CEO and co founder of uh, Parakeeto. It's a software company that helps agencies um, increase their profitability. So uh, they do it by generating accurate data-driven estimates and seconds using their exist existing time tracking data. He's also the uh, fractional COO at Goldfront, an award-winning creative agency out in San Francisco. Uh, he works with brands like Uber, Slack, and Keep. Um, as well, he's the head of uh, the Strategic Coast of SaaS Academy by Dan Martell, and he's the number one coaching program to B2B SaaS in the business world. Um, Marcel, he's also a speaker, podcast host, consultant, specializing in agency profitability optimization. Oh, that's a hard word, profitability optimization. He's helped hundreds of agencies around the world improve profitability. Oh, why do you have to put that in your bio so much? Uh, cash flow in their business. So I'm excited to bring you <laughs> Marcel today. Um, I think the makeup and the wig and the glue just got to me a little bit. So my apologies, Marcel, for butchering your last name three times in a row. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the community sessions. Happy to have you here. It's exciting to be here. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, it's great to join a fellow Canadian company here in Vendasta that's making uh, a big impact in the agency world. And uh, congratulations on making it through the linguistic gymnastics, which is my bio. <laughs> Thank you for, for, for getting through that. Um, as Colleen mentioned, everyone, uh, I'm Marcel and I help agencies run more profitably. That's literally all I do if I'm not eating, sleeping, or watching The Office on an endless loop, eating breakfast foods for every meal of the day. That's what I'm doing. I'm helping agencies make more money. And uh, I do that in a couple of different ways. As she mentioned, I run Parakeeto, and uh, we are a software and consulting firm uh, that does this. We help agencies get the visibility into essentially the questions that they need answers to every single day. Like, are we making money on clients and projects? Can we take on more work? When and who should we hire? Are we estimating things properly? How much should we charge for this project, et cetera? Um, as she mentioned, I also am the CEO at Goldfront. I have a podcast called the agency profit podcast. So if you want to learn how to make more money as an agency, definitely check us out. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to be invited to speak on a lot of really cool stages. And this is no different. Uh, this will be another a logo to add to my slide. But you know, I have authority, people think I'm smart, you guys get the, the idea here. This is why you should trust what I'm going to say today. Ultimately, you should trust what I say today, if you think it makes sense to you. But I won't bore you with the credentials, I want to get straight into the topic du jour, which is how do you make more money as a freelancer or agency, you're in the business of selling services and services are notoriously difficult to scale, because there are a lot of moving pieces when it comes to making sure that those can be sold profitably and that they can be scaled in a way that makes sense that doesn't set you or your team up for working long hours or having cash flow, you know, dip as you add more work, but somehow the process or the amount of time that it takes to get work done is not getting better. So I want to talk through based on my experience, again, working with hundreds of agencies, having thousands tune into our podcast and download our toolkits, what we've learned about helping agencies make more money. And I want to start with the four levels of operations. We think about your sophistication in terms of operations as an agency as having two primary axes. The first is how data-driven are you about the way that your operations system runs? So how much data is being used to inform decisions about who should be hired, forecasting what your resource plan is going to look like, forecasting the cash flow that's going to come from projects in terms of how you accrue revenue, but also how you're accruing costs, when the payment terms are lining up, all these things can be moving in different ways. So how much access to data do you have and how thoughtfully designed is your system for surfacing data? And then secondly, how process oriented are you as an agency? How deliberate are you about the way that you get things done for clients? When you tell a client, we're going to give you XYZ deliverable, how clear is the process for how you do that so that it can be scaled so that the amount of time that it takes and the cost that you incur is consistent. So these are kind of the two key pillars that we see. If you're in a world where you don't really have much data and there isn't really much of a process, then you're in a place that we like to call Firetown. This is not a great place to be. You probably feel a lot like the business is happening to you and not for you. You probably feel like you're kind of behind the eight ball a lot of the time. You're reacting to things. 
and there aren't enough hours in the day and it can feel almost impossible to scale at this point. You might be thinking like, hey, if we added 10 people, what would that feel like? It would feel 10 times worse. I don't wanna do that. And this is where a lot of people start out because the reality is you probably got pulled into running your agency because you were good at what you did. Clients asked you to do more of it. And then the afterthought was, oh yeah, there's a business here that we need to figure out how to run. And so at some point you start to move up the ladder and you might get to a place where you have data, but there isn't much process. So if you're in this place, you might just feel overwhelmed because you can see that things aren't necessarily going well. You can see that um, you know, you're tracking more time on projects than you need to, but you're not necessarily clear on what and how you need to fix that, move it in the right direction. On the other end of the scale, you might be very process oriented, but you don't have much data. In this case, you're gonna be really busy, but maybe not that productive because it's not easy to prioritize the things that need to get fixed for second, third, and last. This is something I say a lot in SAS Academy where it's usually not an if question, but a when question. Those are the hard questions to answer in business. Everything is broken in our business pretty much all the time. Nothing is ever gonna be perfect. There's a million things that keep us up as, at night as entrepreneurs. The question is what do we prioritize first, second, third, fourth? And when we have data to support the decision-making around where do we invest in improving the process for services? What services should, should we be selling more of? Which one should we be selling less of? what is the priority for the next hire, then it becomes a lot easier to make those decisions and have confidence that they're heading in the right direction. And of course, if you have both of these things, then you're ready for scale. Because ideally, you have timely information to help you make great decisions, and you are able to create great processes that allow you to add more people, maintain your margins, maintain the quality of your delivery, and grow the impact that you have on clients to more people. So what I want to walk you through today are the frameworks that we've developed for creating data-driven process improvements so that you can make accurate decisions about where you need to spend time improving processes and growing the business, the most important KPIs that you need to track and exactly how to measure them, the benchmarks you need to aim for, and where you can go find some free resources to implement everything that I teach today without ever spending a dollar, buying any software, or paying us for any of our time. I believe that every agency should have access to this information. Um, and unfortunately, it's not that easy to find. That was my experience when I started my own agency. So I want to make sure that that problem is solved and that our marketing serves more people than our product ever does. And don't get me wrong, I'm marketing to you right now. We all know that's going on, but I still want to make sure that this is a valuable exchange of your time and my time as well. So I want to start with the agency profitability flywheel. Um, but before I get into this, I want to make sure that this is an interactive session. I'm going to be asking you guys some questions in the chat. So I'd first love to know, where's everybody tuning in from in the world? Just let me know the city that you're in before we jump into this framework. And uh, I want to make sure that the chat's working. That I can see everybody's responses. So where are you at? I'm in Prince Edward Island, Charlottetown. We've got St. Louis in the house, Ohio. Nice. Saskatoon, Ariel. Thank you for that. We got Jersey, Joyzy, Robert. Good to see you. Washington. California, beautiful, Manitoba, Los Angeles, Austin, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia, Bay Area, California, Houston, the UK, Scotland, amazing international crowd here. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you uh, humoring me with that. And I appreciate you tuning in and all these different time zones for this. So what are the key elements of building a scalable operation system into your business? The way we look at this, there are four key pieces that work together. And if you implement the four of them properly, you create a system that every time your team does work, it feeds data into operations that makes operations better, more scalable, more accurate. And it all starts with estimation. It's funny, we have a lot of conversations with agencies that come to us because they're not making a lot of profit. Hey, we did 8%, 10%, 12% profit last year. And we know we should be doing 35 What's going on? And a lot of times when we start asking them, well, what's wrong? The answers that we get are, oh, you know, we pay our people too much. We pay our accountant too much. We spend too much on software. And the reality is most of the time, it's just that they don't know how to estimate projects well. Because if you think about it, any forward looking system in operations in your agency depends on your ability to make reliable or at least reasonably reliable assumptions about how much effort and time it's going to take to deliver something to a client over what time horizon that's going to take and some kind of grouping of those assumptions in a way that maps to your resource plan. So you have a sense of what skill sets are going to be required at what time 
during this client engagement. So I can make sure I've got the appropriate people in place. And if I don't, I can go source the appropriate people and skill sets to get that done. Your entire operation system is going to rely on these assumptions being good. And when these assumptions aren't good and you try to build those systems, that's when it starts to feel really, really difficult. It feels like you're kind of pushing quicksand uphill, which is an analogy that I don't think anyone's ever made. It's not the right way to make that analogy, but I think it still makes sense. We're going to keep rolling with it. So estimation is the first key point here to building a scalable <laughs> operation system. There are two elements about estimation that are really important. The first is the method that you use to estimate. If we come up with our assumptions a different way every time, that's not very scalable and it's not gonna create a good foundation that can be iterated on. And the second is the structure, the structure of our assumptions. If the structure of our estimation is changing, and I don't mean the fonts or the headers that you use, but more so the data schema of your estimate. Are we thinking about this in terms of a contract with deliverables, with phases, with tasks? Are we thinking about it more in terms of we have one project that has you know, two deliverables within it, which has different roles within it. So how do we actually think about structuring the assumptions in our estimate? If that's constantly changing, then that creates a moving target downstream that impacts how your time tracking should be set up, how your uh, project management tool should be set up, et cetera. It impacts how the rest of your systems work because if it's constantly changing, that's constantly changing. And then what we end up doing is creating these tranches that make it really hard to compare projects historically. And some of you might've had this experience, right? Where you go into your time tracking tool and you can see every six months, we changed the way that we set up projects because we hired a new PM or we thought we saw a video on YouTube about somebody using it in a different way than us. We thought that's cool. We should try that. But now you can't compare this website project to the one that you did six months ago because the data is completely different. So we want to make sure that we have some consistency in our structure so we can get value out of the data that we create with our operational systems later. So those are the two key steps on estimation. We're going to dig into that a little bit more in today's session. The next piece that we need to make sure we get right is time and cost tracking. So now that we've made assumptions about what it's going to take to get client work done, we need to create a feedback loop so that we know if those assumptions make sense or not. Let me know in the chat when the last time was that you pulled up an estimate and compared the actual hours that it took for every single phase in a project to the estimate. And how long did it take you? Bonus points if you can tell me how long it took you to run that report. The thing that we see constantly in our practice, yeah, Colleen says never. Uh, the thing that we see constantly in our consulting practice is we lift up the hood and we find out yeah, this takes you two hours to do because when you go into the time tracking tool, we're tracking time against tasks. And when we look at the estimate, you're thinking about it in terms of design hours, development hours, PM hours, et cetera. The data schema doesn't match up. Therefore, it takes a lot of manual cleanup to answer that question. Therefore, it never gets done because guess what? You've got way more important things to spend two hours on. I get it. You're running a business. You've got clients. You've got fires to put out. You've got employees that need your help. Um, so of course, this isn't going to get prioritized. So we need to make this frictionless. We do that with thoughtful data schema design. So the thing with time and cost tracking is again, making sure that it is aligned, aligned to the estimate. By the way, this is the key thing that our platform does is it helps you create alignment to the estimate without ever actually having to go back and change or clean up your historical data. We create a normalization layer. Um, but anyway, I'm not gonna bore you with that pitch. We can talk about that later. Dylan, I'm working right now and I will call you back after. So that's the first half of the flywheel. And this is what creates what I like to call our data feedback loop, right? So this is the objective thing that nobody can argue with about what happened. So that when we go into our project retros or when somebody comes into our office and says, we need to hire four more designers yesterday because we are overworked, you have some data that you can pull up and look at and use to facilitate the conversation. So for the objective parts, everybody can be on the same page. And then we can just start having a collaborative conversation about why, what's going on and what do we do about it? So this is our data feedback loop over here. The second piece of this is what we do with this information. So of course we wanna have a cadence of reports and meetings whereby we're sitting down to look at what actually happened, what was our earning efficiency on this project, what was the amount of time that it took us relative to our assumptions, 
And then we feed that into conversations about why. This project was incredible. We spent half as much time as we thought we were going to. What did we do differently that we want to apply to other projects? That's going to serve us some ideas. Oh, we had a really smooth handoff from design to dev. Oh, the way that the client gave us their rec requirements was super clear and the structure was really compatible with the way that we do wireframing. Awesome. Let's capture that. Let's create a process so we can apply that to the next project. And then similarly, this project was a total dumpster fire. What happened? Why was it this way? Did we miss something about the estimation? Was there something about our process that we overlooked? Was there a clunky handoff? What do we need to double click on here to figure out how we can prevent this from happening in the future? That leads to process improvements, which is key because of course, sometimes we are bad at estimating just because we're bad at estimating. We don't have a lot of data. Maybe the person doing it hasn't been around for a while, but sometimes we're bad at estimating because the thing we're trying to estimate just isn't really well defined. So closing this loop, we have to continue to define the process so that the thing that we're trying to scope becomes easier to scope because it becomes more predictable. So I know this is hard to read, uh, process improvements. If you're taking notes, I apologize for my chicken scratch. So this is the second part of the feedback loop here. And this is what I like to call the people feedback. And this is where we bake into meeting cadences and conversations, and we're talking about process improvement. If we nail these four things and we bake this into the organization such that it's always happening, these meetings are scheduled, they're in the calendar, these reports are getting generated on a cadence, the data is being maintained, the schema is being respected, then we should get to a place where the regular day-to-day -day operations of our business creates profit and scale. Every time we do a project, we learn how to do it more efficiently. Every time we do a project, we learn how to define the process for doing that better. And we're creating buy-in on the processes because the team is involved in getting this done. And so at scale, what this looks like is you don't even have to be involved as the owner. This process is clearly and well enough to find that your team can be running this conversation, running this feedback loop on their own. So this is the core thesis behind everything that we do. I wanna pause here and field questions, feedback from the chat. Is this resonating with anyone? If this is making sense to you, give me a yes in the chat. I'd love to hear how we're doing on this. And then we'll dig into some of the details here. Thank you, Steven. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate that. Daryl, awesome. Donald, thank you for that. All right, so we're gonna dig in. We're gonna talk about estimation for a moment. So you're gonna get a look inside my brain it's a little scary, but this is how we think about estimation. At the end of the day, this is really how most people do it and how this feedback loop actually creates something that's very objective around estimation. Give me a yes in the chat if um, the way that you estimate is basically just putting a finger in the air and saying, mm, I think it's going to take about this much time. Or if you feel like the only person in your agency that can estimate is uh, you know, the group of people that have been there for a really long time and they've just seen enough projects that they can they can make a, an educated guess about this and get relatively close. Donald, I love that you're using SOPs and BOEs. So I'm glad that this is not the case for you. I'm curious if it is for anybody else. If it is, I want to talk to you about how we get to a place where anybody in your organization, even a junior salesperson, is able to create materially accurate estimates and put prices in front of clients that are not going to set you up for failure without ever having to really have uh, deep experience in the subject matter and the process for how you deliver things. So the way we think about estimation is that there's basically two axes. And this is the mental model that we're all pretty much going through when we're in the middle of a client conversation and we're asking them about what is it that you want us to do for you? What are your needs? We have effort on this scale. Usually we're quantifying that in terms of hours. Maybe if you run an agile shop, this might be story points. It might be something else, but generally we're measuring effort in terms of time. Then on this end, we have what we call our scoping metrics. And for most people, this is going to be total hours or it's going to be the budget. If you build websites, for example, this might be the number of web pages. If you write content, this might be the number of blogs, the number of words. If you're doing social posts, this might be the number of social posts that you have to create. But it's some kind of metric that quantifies the complexity or the uh, scale of what the client is asking for. These are the questions that you're asking during the discovery process to figure out what is the client asking me for here? What kind of effort is gonna be required? So the way that we think about estimation processes, we have to define what it is that we're selling. 
define what questions we need to ask to quantify effort. And if we can start to create data points with every project where this was, you know, here on the effort graph and it required this many hours. So these are all projects. As we start to place projects on this graph, over time, we create a line of best fit. And this can help us reasonably accurately triangulate the amount of effort that's going to be required. If our data schema is thoughtfully designed, we can start to group this in terms of, you can imagine this graph is like how many PM hours, right? How many PM hours does it take for a website that has 15 pages and has, you know, a two X contingency because the client, you know, seems like they're going to be a little bit difficult, might require a little bit more time. So we identify that like, okay, this website is about here on the axis. So that means there should be about this many hours of PM time. So as we place more dots on the graph, this line becomes more reliable. And then as we close the loop with process, we start to develop process. That process starts to push the variability of those data points closer to the middle line. And those two forces, which again are built into the flywheel, those data points get created here. The process starts to push them in the middle over here. Over time, our model for estimation gets more and more accurate, which means all you have to do at this point, once this process is well-defined, is take any junior salesperson, any person that's on the phone with clients and say, ask them these three questions. This is the scale that you rate their answers on. Find out where they land on the effort scale or on the complexity scale. And this is roughly how much time it's going to take. Now we layer on our financial modeling. We know we want to have an average billable rate of $175 an hour. Boom. That's the minimum price that we need to charge the client. So this is how we think about building really programmatic estimation processes that can support your team and make this more accurate, but also less time consuming and really set a strong foundation for your agency. Is that making sense to everyone? Any questions on that in the chat? Let me know. We'll make sure to address those at the end of the session. I got one last thing to go through and then we'll open it up for Q and A. Boom. All right. We got some feedback here. I'm the one who creates the estimates based on previous experience and knowledge. Yeah, wet finger in the wind. Typically look at previous projects and their timetable, also a rate sheet. Awesome, Renee. Good. So like there's elements of this that are happening, uh, which is good. And it's just about thinking about how to make this uh, a little bit tighter. We're going to skip over data schema complexity a little bit here, but the thing I want to impress upon you here is when I do this talk, a lot of what I see afterwards is people go, okay, we need to go into our time tracking tool and add a lot more detail. But the risk with that, of course, is the more detail you add to your data schema, the more expensive and time consuming it becomes to maintain. And also the smaller the samples of data that you're going to get, the larger the volume of projects that you need in order to create um, any kind of significance in our grouping. So just understand that generally when we're thinking about designing a data scheme, we want to start simple, start with like project role, then maybe later on we add phases. And then maybe later on, if we have a project management tool that we can integrate time tracking into, we can add tasks. But the tendency here is to get really complex early. And I would urge you to do the opposite. If you're going in to redesign how you set up your data schema, start with a simple model that is easier to maintain. And that's going to get you larger groupings of data and then add on complexity as you find that it's needed, as you find that questions come up in your discussions with the team that you can't answer. But what you'll probably find is that those questions don't come up as often as you anticipate. And a lot of the complexity that you would have otherwise added um, ends up not being necessary and therefore saves you a lot of time and effort in terms of setting up this system. So the last thing I want to touch on here is some of the metrics, right? So how does an agency make money? Hopefully this isn't news to you, but essentially you have capacity. That capacity might be elastic. It might not be. For those of you that have a full-time team, you're paying a salary. And so essentially you're incentivized to make sure that as much of those uh, people's time is being used for things that earn you money as possible. If you're using freelancers, then that burden is decreased. You're not paying for the time that they're not busy. You're generally just paying a premium for the time that they are busy, but in return, you get more flexibility in terms of how much sales consistency you get to have in the agency. But if you have a full-time team, understand that you have a utilization uh, ratio, and then you're going to have an average billable rate. So this, this average billable rate to me is one of the easiest ways to track earning efficiency, which is the measure of essentially gross margin, but it's an abstracted way to think about that. So how efficiently do we earn revenue, uh, which means 
how good of a job do we do of charging for something and then spending a lot less costs on getting that done for the client so that there's enough meat on the bone there for us to pay for our overhead, run the business and still have a profit at the end of the day. Average billable rate is the easy way to calculate that. You just take your revenue, you divide it by the number of hours it took you to earn that revenue. And then that gives you an easy benchmark. So you can start comparing projects and clients against each other and figure out, okay, where are we making the most money? So the formula for your company's revenue is your capacity multiplied by your utilization multiplied by average billable rate. That's going to give you the agency gross income that your agency can handle. And this is a useful tool if you're trying to figure out what amount of revenue should we be making in a given period of time. You can take the capacity that you have on your team. So let's say 10 employees times 2,080 hours per year. You expect them to be 65% utilized, which by the way is our target for utilization based on gross capacity. And we multiply that by the average billable rate that we want to make. Let's call that $150 per hour. So you can take 2,080 hours, multiply the number of people on your team, multiply that by 65, multiply that by 150. That tells you how much revenue you should be able to generate in a given period of time or what the target should be. So this is a really useful formula to just think about like how close or far away from our theoretical capacity are we which should give you an indication of how much money you're leaving on the table. So when it comes to making a profit after the fact, you want to make sure that you're managing your overhead. So we want to think about this in terms of your AGI minus your direct labor costs. That's going to get you to gross profit or gross margin. So generally you want your labor costs to be 30 to 50% of your AGI, which means you want between a 50 and a 70% gross margin. And then you want to spend another 20 to 30% on overhead, which leaves you with a reasonable profit margin on the very high end. You're going to be, you know, in the forties on the low end, you're going to be around 15. We encourage most of our uh, clients to shoot for a 25% at profit at the end of the year. So if you did a million bucks, you should have a quarter million dollars left over at the end of the year, at least after paying yourself a market rate salary which is minimum $100,000. If you run an agency, you can probably go to market and get a lot more than that. Last thing I want to speak on is the overhead model. So you should be spending anywhere from four to 6% of your AGI on facilities. That's your rent, utilities, phones, et cetera. You should be spending anywhere from 10 to 14% on sales and marketing and anywhere from eight to 14% on admin. And a big part of the skew here between sales and admin is going to be where does your salary go or the founding team salary go? Where are you spending the most of your time? And again, your total should sit somewhere between 20 and 30%. If you have a full-time in-house team, you're going to be closer to that end of the spectrum. If you're using more freelancers, you'll be closer to the end of 20%, but you'll also probably have a slightly higher direct labor cost because you're generally, again, paying a premium for a freelancer's time relative to what you could get on an hourly cost basis if you were to bulk purchase a year of their life in advance for a fixed fee, which is essentially all a salary is. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, you've been drinking from the fire hose. We're gonna do a second part to this session next week where I'm gonna take you through some more things, how to think about utilization, how to think about average billable rate, and then how to think about running meetings around these metrics so you can take them and actually turn them into insight and action for your team. But for today, we're going to leave it at that. And I want to make sure that we take some time and open it up for questions. So uh, I'm going to let Colleen manage the Q&A session, but uh, I hope that this was helpful and I look forward to hearing where else I can be helpful. Awesome. Thank you, Marcel. I mean, I won't lie. Some of the numbers get a little overwhelming. If you go back up two <laughs> slides, um, one more, no, nope, keep, mm. keep rolling. No, nope, no, nope, it was lower. Okay. That one right there, the agency model with utilization, ABR, one above. There you go. What does ABR mean? Average billable rate. So Average this, billable rate. this is a funny thing, right? I ask people, what's your rate? And they go, oh, it's $150 an hour. And I go, oh, that's cool. And then um, I'm like, okay, so you made a million dollars last year and your team spent See, you're going to see how, like, I, I use a calculator. I'm a millennial, right? I never did this stuff on paper. I always use a calculator. Okay, so you did a million dollars last year, and you spent uh, 10,000 hours on that. Um, so actually, your average billable rate was 100 bucks an hour, not 150. So it's not what you 
are thinking in your head when you give a client a price. It's not the number that you'd like to make. It's the actual level of efficiency that your agency has when you go to earn revenue, which is often very different than what's on your rate card or what your target is or what you're hoping you're going to make when you give a quote to a client. Um, it's easy to calculate. Again, you just take the revenue from a client, you divide it by the number of hours that you spent to earn that revenue. And very quickly, you can start to see, oh, geez, like we make $175 on websites per hour. But when we sell this other thing, this, you know, I don't know, we'll call it SEO services, we make 125. It's a really easy way to start benchmarking things and getting a sense of like, okay, where should we be doubling down on our sales efforts? Or where do we need to start making some process improvements so we can get that number up? Um, so yeah, that's, that's why I like average global rate. It's kind of the quick and easy day-to-day -day metric for gross margin. It's just an abstracted mm -hmm. version of gross margin. Okay, man. One acronym can mean all of that. Holy. Mm -hmm. Um, so questions, <laughs> let's light up this chat or if you are comfortable, unmute yourself. Um, we had some good co comments that this was making a sense to a lot of people. Pru, I did like your, uh, comment, slow nod. That was kind of my idea as well. I, yeah, I think I'm getting it. Um, who wants to unmute themselves and ask the first question? I know people are always kind of timid to ask the first question. Who's gonna do it? I'm looking at your faces. One of you's I, gonna I can, do it. I can start with a question I get a lot while we, uh, while we wait for folks to conjure something up. Um, one of the questions I get a lot at this stage is, okay, great. Nori has a question about utilization. Let's bring on Nori. Uh, how do you calculate uh, utilization? What a great question. Let's talk about utilization. I love this question. So this is one of the hilarious things about our industry, isn't it? I asked 10 agencies how they calculate utilization. I get 10 different answers. What is, because within the question of utilization, you have three questions. The first is what is capacity, right? So the questions I get a lot around capacity are, okay, well, what about vacations? What about time off? What about holidays? What about weekends? Um, what is it billable capacity? Is it gross capacity or is it some kind of weird thing in between? So the funny thing about this is there isn't actually an answer um, because there isn't some kind of governing board that's overseeing agencies telling us like this is the right way to calculate this and frankly most of the accountants that i talk to um, that aren't specialized in helping agencies really don't know what they're talking about they don't even know how to calculate gross margin properly for agencies most of you are probably not seeing that number on your pnl which is unfortunate so we have developed a parakeeto uh, something we call the parakeeto way it's this very big document internally where we've defined every single metric and we've defined them in the context of a system where they all work together. So all that to say, my POV on capacity is that it is the total amount of time that you are purchasing from someone in your employment contract. For most people, that's 2,080 hours per year, which is 40 hours per week times 52 weeks. We are not taking out holidays. We are not taking out time off. We are not taking out vacation. We are going to consider that in our modeling, but we're gonna put that cost somewhere else. We're gonna put that cost in a shared production expense. And the reason that we do that is because it makes this a horizontally uh, consistent metric. So when we're, when we're comparing to different periods of time, when we're comparing to different um, agencies, when we're comparing from one department to another, we're not taking this thing that's very variable, which is how much time off does somebody get? How much were they sick, right? All these things that are kind of out of the purview of our single project. And we're abstracting them out. So it actually makes it easier to compare things. It's the same reason that accountants use EBITDA to compare businesses across each other because taxes are different from one state to another. So you actually can't compare um, profit on a company by company basis. You have to go up to EBITDA and take things out like amortization, depreciation, taxes, et cetera. So this is how we think about capacity. So 2,080 hours is generally what you're looking at, but you just do the math. How many hours a week? How many weeks per year? that's a person's gross capacity. Then what we want to think about here is um, how many billable hours do they work in a given period of time? So now let's talk about what is a billable hour? Again, I asked 10 agencies, I get 10 different answers. A billable hour is an hour of time that is spent earning revenue for a client in the context of our system, the Parakeeto way. 
it is not a productive hour. So if they worked on your company website, is that billable? No. Is it productive? Absolutely it is. If you ask them to do it, that's a great thing, but it is not billable. And I think the reason that uh, this has gotten mixed up as a definition is because historically, especially in time and materials agencies, billable hours and utilization were a measure uh, or a metric that was exposed to the team and the team was held accountable to it. Because when you're billing by the hour, everybody's incentivized to bill as many hours as possible. But if you're not billing by the hour, there is no point in exposing this to your team. It's only going to degrade the quality of your time tracking data, and it's going to set them up for bad incentives. Their productivity is not measured by utilization. Their productivity is measured by earning efficiency, which is inversely correlated. They want to spend less time to get the same thing done for the client. That's good for your business because it increases your revenue capacity by increasing your average billable rate. So we think about billable hours in terms of how many hours were spent earning revenue for a client. And it doesn't matter if that hour actually earns you more money or not. If it was necessary to complete a deliverable, then it's a billable hour. You divide those two numbers together. That's your utilization. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question, Nori? Do you have any other questions on that? I'm just going to unmute myself. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. I, I have to do a little bit of, um, I'm so used to utilization being um, more in a, like a help desk manner. Right. So it's, it's kind of like changing out those terms. So, but it makes perfect sense. And the billable hours part is, is kind of hidden in there, but it, it's definitely a, an eye opener as well. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Laverne, you have your hand up. I do. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Floor right. is yours. <laughs> Thank you. So at what point uh, would, I'm a new agency, so when would you say would be a good point to start implementing uh, this type of process? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, what kind of scale are we at now, Laverne? Is it just you or do you have a couple of people working with you? Just me and my son. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So the thing that I would encourage you to think about here is let's keep it lightweight. Um, I would spend maybe one afternoon, if you can block out one afternoon over the next couple of weeks and do two things at your stage. The first is create a standard format for your estimates, right? So when you're figuring out how much time it takes to uh, do a project for a client, um, and there's a sidebar here that I won't go on yet, but pricing and scoping are not the same exercise. We're talking about just figuring out how much time is it going to take? What's your estimate? Just make sure that that format is locked in and it's standardized so that all of your estimates kind of look the same. And think about the grouping of time in terms of if I was going to go and hire people to do parts of this, how would I be thinking about those groups of people, right? Am I thinking about it in terms of like designer, project manager, engineer, uh, data analyst, et cetera? Like what are the types of roles Think about the time in terms of those buckets and then start tracking your time as you do projects. That way you can come back in six months when hopefully, you know, the business is growing, you're getting more clients and you're like, okay, we need to hire some people and you can have a look at how much time does it actually take me to do these things and how much time do I spend playing each of these roles? And it'll make it really clear to you who you need to hire in order to buy back the highest portion of your time on a project. And it gives you some predictability. It helps mitigate the risk around how much it's going to cost you. So you can model that ahead of time. If you know, okay, when we build a website, it's about 20 hours of PM time. And I know a PM is going to cost me 50 bucks an hour. You can do the math and de-risk that higher way better than if you only at that point start thinking about, I wonder how much time it's going to take them to, you know, come in and do this website project. I'm, I wonder how much it's going to cost me. Does that make sense? That makes absolute sense. Thank you so much for that. My pleasure and good luck. I'm, I'm wishing you all the best with this. Uh, thank thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Hey, we had someone, I think it was Donald in the chat. Um, he said 80% of man hour. I'm not sure in what uh, context that meant. Uh, Donald, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I was talking yeah. about capacity or your billable hours is usually about 80% of uh, a man hour. 
Yeah. So let's, let's talk about uh, utilization targets for a moment. I think that's a great, I appreciate you bringing that up, Donald. So really quick, the formula is uh, it's going to be billable hours, billable hours divided by capacity. So there's kind of two utilization targets. The first is your week to week target, your weekly expectation. And this expectation is kind of like, everything is normal this week. We have five work days. There's no holidays. There's no time off. This person isn't sick. They're going to be in the office for whatever amount of time is culturally appropriate for your workplace, 36 hours, 40 hours, 25 hours, whatever you're doing, right? That expectation usually is going to be somewhere between 75 and 90% for most pure production roles in an agency on a week to week basis. So a designer, a copywriter, a web developer, roles like that, where their job is to come in and just get deliverables done for the client. They're generally going to be expected to spend 75 to 90% of their time in a regular week being billable. So that means anywhere from 30 to maybe 36, 38 hours on the very high end. Some agencies want to run people hotter than that. I'm not going to comment on that other than to say, I don't think that's very sustainable and it's a good way to churn through talent. And right now, seems like it's not very easy to find talent. So it's probably not a good idea. Also, it's not necessary to be profitable, but that's your kind of week to week expectation. On an annual basis, you're going to assume generally about a 10 to 20% loss, depending on what your holiday vacation time, sick time policy is for all that time off that lost productivity. So on an annual basis, their annual target should be, again, their weekly target minus probably about 15%. And as an agency, you should be trying to get a team composition that can net out at 60% to maybe 65% utilization at the end of the year. So when you take everybody that works for you, including the people that are never billable, like maybe somebody that's an admin or a salesperson, right? Stack all of their capacity together, figure out what their billable expectation is, figure out how much time off they're going to take, et cetera. By the way, we have a tool that does this for you that's free in our toolkit, which I'll plug here in a moment, um, but it'll do all this modeling for you. And your total utilization target for the year net should be around 60 to 65%. Um, that tells you that you've got a decent balance in the team. You don't have too many non-billable roles versus billable roles. The people that are billable have a good enough expectation and it puts you in a reasonably good place to have good uh, AGI capacity, as long as your earning efficiency is healthy, you're, you're making a decent average billable rate for every hour uh, that you work. Is that helpful? Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the pumpkin guy come up behind me. So it's a good cameo. Yeah. Yeah. He's not even listening to me anymore. So that's fine. Um, okay. I think we have time for probably one more question. Oh, Sally. You have your hand raised. Yes, hi, hi Marcel, thanks for this. Um, I actually went to St. Abex U, just the next province over. Um, nice. Could you give us your podcast um, information in the chat so we can listen in? I would love to do that. I would love to do that. Would you like it on iTunes? What's your, what's your podcast platform of choice? Uh, actually, I'll just drop you the, the main page and then you can find it wherever you want, Agency Profit Podcast. Thank you. Yeah, I think our SEO is pretty good. So if you just Google Agency Profitability, we should show up. Um, the first post is either us or it's WordStream, but I wrote the post for WordStream. So we ha usually have the first two spots there. Uh, the Agency Profit Podcast should be the first result, but there it is in the chat. And yeah, since we are getting to time, I want to make sure everybody knows about the toolkit. So um, Again, my belief is that uh, every agency should be able to do this stuff on their own without spending any money um, on software, on consulting. Um, if you're below a million dollars in revenue, I can't even sell you anything because our services are priced at a point where you kind of have to be doing more than a million dollars a year in revenue to use them. So I created this to make sure that everybody could be served by what we're doing. In the toolkit, you're going to find training videos where I go through all the things that I'm talking about here in the flywheel in more detail. I provide templates, I provide checklists that have these formulas um, and some spreadsheets that you can use to actually implement what I'm talking about here. And each of them have training videos that walk you through exactly how to use them. So if you're interested in taking what you learned here today and applying it in your business, you can go to parakeeto.com forward slash toolkit and get access to all of that absolutely free. 
I am going to ask you for your email address. I am going to spam you with emails afterwards. You can unsubscribe to them if they're not helpful, but I try to make them helpful because I talk about agency profitability. So full disclosure, that's what I'm about. Uh, and hopefully that's helpful for all of you. At least he's honest, everyone, and said he was going to send you emails. That's I'm nice. talking to a group of marketers here. So like we, let, they we, already we can all know. just be candid about what's yeah, going on. Yeah, let's be you know real here. Works. <laughs> um, okay, like I said, we have uh, one more question. Sally says she loves your transparency. Um, I don't know if I, I think I, there was a question in the chat and maybe I missed it. Um, oh, Sean, you were asking if it would be recorded. So. Um, yeah, I hope so. I think it is being recorded. I would love a copy. Um, absolutely. If, if I can get one. And I'm happy to send these slides as well if uh, you want to email this out to the crew after the fact. Absolutely. Uh, helpful. Um, 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 maybe don't like take my face out of this recording if you would like, Marcel. I mean, otherwise, you're just going to have like a weird skeleton, but hey. Yeah. It, you our, do you. our social feed over the next three weeks will just be clips of you me um, doing yeah, dance just, moves just, it'll be mostly the banter for the first 10 minutes of the call while we were waiting for everyone to come on yeah so cool. for yeah. sure okay. um if someone would like to uh, join me we can actually show you our full costume what well, um, is doing that marcel people are very curious about your presentation software and what you're using for this yeah yeah, great question. So I'm using an iPad Pro, actually not even a new one, a really old iPad Pro with like the first gen iPad uh, pencil. I'm using an app called Notability and you can just drop any PDF into Notability and draw on it, super easy. So I do all my PDFs in Google Slides. I drop them in here and use them for the presentations. This is an incredible sales tool. So if you end up explaining mm -hmm. things to clients when you're selling to them, this is such an amazing way to make that conversation so much more helpful for them. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really been a game changer for things like this and our sales process as well. Love that. Um, yeah, I think, no. it, are we at time? Uh, any more questions? I do have, has, do you guys watch SNL? I hope, I hope so. Nice. Oh, the, Nori's asking for the toolkit link. Yeah, I'll drop that in the chat here. Yes. Perfect. Yes, of course, SNL. Yeah, okay, well, do you know who this is? I'm David S. Pumpkins. <laughs> oh, that's Tom Hanks, isn't it? <laughs> Tom Hanks plays that character. Oh my God. <laughs> I should have stopped recording, oh my goodness. This is fun. Robert, I just have to say, like, I love what's going on with you right now. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but you look so smooth and suave. And I feel like. Is I it just... your filter or did you put something on? I think the filter's on, but I'll, I'll, I think what he's looking for, you know, is when I do, when I do this one. Oh. You know? <laughs> there you go. The Reggie Watts going on now. There it is. I love it, man. Oh, look happy at this. Halloween, everyone. <laughs> Okay. I, w I wish I could be cool for Halloween too. Just come to Vendasta awesome. or every other week. There's usually some theme that we're doing. So all right, <laughs> keeps well, things thank interesting. You. Thank okay. you for having me. This was fun. And yes. I'll look forward to next week's session. Tell yes, your friends. Tell all your friends. Marcel's back next week and he's going to go over the last two pieces of that flywheel. So uh, thank you, Marcel, for coming. This is recorded. It will be posted in the community. Uh, we'll share the slides for you as well so you can get some, uh, take some good notes and reference the slides. So thank you, everyone. Uh, happy Halloween from Vindasta. Um, next week, I won't be dressed like this. Or I will. It's a surprise. Okay, everyone take care. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for coming.